Well hi there and welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Rusty and this is me channel where I talk about my favorite movies, mostly horror, and my favorite music, mostly metal, and I promise I will get back to that. I'm going to do a nice little five finger death punch concert soon. But um, I want to talk about one of my absolute favorite uh, horror slasher slasher trilogies of all time it's a fascinating trilogy to me i absolutely adore it as a matter of fact the third one cold uh cold prey 3 cold prey tree is in my top 20 slashers of all time which um i'm gonna do some lists here soon but uh yeah cold prey th tree is um the one that's least liked but to me it is glorious and I'll talk about it and um, it's in my top 20 slashers of all time ever and ever and ever forever but we're gonna start of course with the first one that was released I thought about doing them in chronological order because Coldplay cold I'm gonna say Coldplay okay I don't know why I don't even like that group <laughs> Coldplay 3 um, is actually a prequel so chronologically that's the one that I watch first now but um, we'll do it by release and that is Cold Prey I absolutely adore this movie now Cold Prey was released in what 2006 and it is from Denmark. These are Danish movies, so that's kind of cool. Um, you don't hear a lot of stuff about, you know, it's not like they're the horror capital of the world or anything. So this was pretty surprising to people for this to be so absolutely out of this world phenomenal. But um, Cold Prey was released in 2006. It's an hour and 37 minutes long, so it's not a shorty, which is cool. Um, I might not even attempt this, but it was directed by a Dane, <laughs> who I don't want to butcher his name, Rora Uthog, was written by Thomas Moldstead, that was easy enough, and, um, it stars, and I don't know if I want to do that either, Ingrid Bolso Berdahl, Roth Christian Larson, it's not too bad. Thomas Alf Larson. Are they related? I didn't see anybody in here that looked related. I might have to investigate that. But yeah, so it was released in 2006, like I said. And let's get down to it. Now, um, and probably on the third one, I will really talk about how fascinating this trilogy is but um, this trilogy is basically a, an ode to The Shining it kind of takes a lot from The Shining not in story but there is an awful lot of nods to The Shining in this movie so uh, we start out with um, a, an, an 11 year old boy running through the snow and we see his parents being interviewed and they seem a little weird and even the sheriff you know kind of like watches their interview with this weird feeling but um, they claim that he has ran away now this is one of the few movies that star a person or a character with a facial birthmark you know usually um, I have a movie called, a horror movie called Heartless that is about a character with a big heart-shaped facial tattoo. There is also a beautiful movie called Twelve and Holding. Did I do a video on that? I don't know. I'll have to look. But those are the two that I remember well. This one, this little boy, he's got a facial tattoo, uh, a facial birthmark. And um, I actually think it looks kind of cool. I don't know why people would be so upset about it. I guess it's according to what the birthmark looked like. I like the facial birthmark in Heartless. And um, so the parents, of course, 
can't stand him. And uh, we see this kid looks like he's running through the snow. Uh, this The setting of this movie is like The Shining. It's in a mountain lodge, you know, with a big... Um, of course, it's not like that hotel, but I mean, it's a lodge. And it's got a, a beautiful kitchen and a big dining room. And uh, it's a huge little establishment. And I guess the parents run this establishment. And um, so, yeah, we see this little boy running through the slow snow and his parents being interviewed on TV about their missing son. So we then kind of uh, flash forward to the movie where we are introduced to um, the stars, which is Yannicka, which is a cool name. I like that name, her name, Yannicka. She is the star of this movie. So we have Yannicka and Morton and Eric and Mikal and Ingen. And they are going on a ski trip, where they're, or a snowboarding trip, where they're going to snowboard in the mountains. They park their car, they go up, and they're doing their little snowboarding stuff. When, um, unfortunately, Morton, and of course it's sort of my crush of the movie is Morton, but he gets an ugly graphic leg break. So his leg gets broken, and when they show it, they show it. I mean, it's a protruding bone, and they have to snap it back into place. Now, they are a great distance from their car, and they have no way to carry him. So they're in a little pickle here and don't exactly know, you know, what to do. Um, it's going to take, you know, can one of them go back to the car? Uh, can one of them try to make it to a nearby village? when the girl, Yannicka, notices at the top of the hill, she notices this lodge. Now this lodge has been abandoned for a very long time. Remember, this is 2006. Uh, the little flashback that we saw of the little boy was taking place in 1975, or the end of 1975, the beginning of 1976. Um, so they go to this lodge carrying him and the lodge is really cool the lodge is really spooky it's been abandoned yet it's sort of abandoned as is which is kind of weird um you know the the bar is still full of liquor um, the rooms and everything so it's just been abandoned I don't know why it would have been abandoned for that long but it is so they go to the hotel and they settle in trying to figure out well you know what are we going to do now that they found this place it's got a little food in it in the kitchen canned food um, they light a fire in the a fireplace and they start trying to help Morrison uh, they definitely, they start ransacking the, the lodge for needle and thread or bandage or an alcohol, something. So they end up like pouring alcohol on it um, and she finds a tube of super glue, which I didn't know you could do that, but I looked it up afterwards and you actually can. Super glue is good for, you know, if you're out somewhere and you get this giant cut you can actually super glue it together so that was kind of neat so they did that and they sort of settle in for the night and they are going to you know one of them is going to leave the next day come morning time to try to get back to the car to go get help so we're set up in this little situation and um who are the couples um Eric manages to, in the basement, manages to find the generator, and there's still plenty of big barrels of gas, so petrol, so they get the, actually get the lights on, and um, we do see the door kind of flies open, and Yannicka goes out to it, and she thinks she sees a shadow out there in the snow, and that's the one and only, and I'll explain that in a minute, that's the only really the only hint that we get 
um, that anything is going on, which I found a very interesting directorial direction, which worked, and, and I will explain why for me. But um, And you can go and look in International Movie Database. This movie has got a very, very high rating for a horror movie. It is pretty beloved, this movie, Cold Prey. So, um, Ingrid, or Ingun, and I think it's Mikhail. Yeah. Mikhail, they are a couple. So, they, as they're settling down for the night, they go off to find one of the rooms that they're going to stay in. And Eric and Yannicka stay with Mar Morton in the living room where the fire is at. So, while we're up there, um, who is it? Mike, Michael and Ingen. I'm going to have problems with these names. But they end up like kind of touring up there in all of the rooms. And interestingly enough, they find a room uh, that has been burnt out. No, nothing else in the lodge is damaged except that one room and it had kind of been burnt out and it was room 237 um, I think we all know what room 237 is a nod to so um, they, they go to bed and she kind of refuses if you know what I mean because she says they haven't been together long enough this makes him mad so he leaves the room and goes downstairs with the rest of them. Um, he's kind of pissed off because, you know, she wouldn't sleep with him. And um, she starts to get a little frustrated. She tries the shower to see, you know, if um, it works. It, of course, doesn't. It's what little water comes out is like this cloggy, bloody mess. And that's when we get our first jump scare. Now, that's what I was talking about, the directorial direction and the writing direction. This is 38 minutes into the movie. And you have been given, and I think that's the reason, because I'm going to tell you, the jump scare that, is, that occurs right there is one of the best jump scares I've seen in any horror movie ever. And the reason that it is so scary is because you are completely caught off guard. The reason that you are caught off guard and what is so special about this movie is that I told you it's 38 minutes into the movie. The director and writer have shown you nothing. There's none of the typical tropes that you see in a horror movie. There's no point of view uh, shots where you see the killer looking at them or watching them from around the corner or stalking them. Um, you have seen nothing. There's no subtle clues. There's no visual. Like there was just that one time that she thought she saw a shadow out there in the snow 15 minutes ago. So you are completely not in a horror mindset you are digging the atmosphere you're listening to their conversation you're seeing this little short melodrama between these two Mikhail and Ingrid Ingen, and um, the killer is in the room and he walks by the camera while she's got her back turned in the bathroom and I literally nearly flipped over the back of the chair because I wasn't there. I wasn't in the zone. I wasn't in the... You're, you're caught off guard. You see, you don't have your defenses up. When you watch a horror movie, you, you know it's a slasher. You know it's a horror movie. You're waiting for it. But, but you haven't been given any of the typical tropes, any of the typical clues that get you in the zone to be looking for the jump scare, to be looking for the kill to be you know uh oh don't open that door you know you're you're no you're not in the zone in any way shape or form boom it's just like that 
and I nearly flew over the back of the chair the first time I saw it. It is a excellent, and I of course just did a marathon yesterday of these three, and it made me jump again, and I was like, oh shit, I forgot about that. <laughs> and um, so she thinks somebody just walked behind her, which they did, and she turns around and she kind of steps out into the hall, doesn't see anything, goes back into the room, and now you're, you're tense, and, but it still gets you again, because she grabs her stuff, and she's like, I'm getting the hell down there with the other people, and just that quick, she is attacked and pickaxed, like, you know, he pickaxes her in the back, um, she manages to get out into the hall, he is, it, you, it, you just were not ready for it, you just weren't expecting it, and it is a fantastic chase scene as she tries to get to them. Now, um, Morton and Mikhail, you know, Mikhail is down there, and the other three, they have had to help Morton out to the snow to pee, which is kind of funny. So, that poor girl, Ingen, though, she gets right there to the stairs that leads right there. They're right there. And she manages, after being pickaxed like multiple times, blood everywhere, she gets right there to her hand on the top landing where they're all sitting and coming back in. And he gets her one final time uh, with the pickaxe and drags her off. And just as that happens, Mikhail walks by. That's how close she was to help and none of them knew it. As a matter of fact, they were, you know, Yannicka and Martin, Morton and Eric were just coming in the front door and they heard uh, the scuffle and they were like, is anyone there? And that's when Mikhail said, hi, it's just me because he's making a drink. So that was a really cool kill. Definitely worth waiting 38 minutes for. Um, and I really liked the way that they kept you off guard and didn't give you any of the clues. Now, you are definitely in the zone, and the movie takes off from here. You know, because she's she has been butchered. And they start, you know, they have the little clues laying around, like when she opens up the um, register book. She notices that there hasn't been a register and uh, nothing's been written in it since 1975. She finds a picture of the mom and dad and the little boy that was missing. And, um, yeah, so, you know, we're there. And, I, of course, I've gotten them. I wrote so many notes, and so I'm trying to com condense it. But the next morning, um... Mikhail goes and makes a little breakfast to take up to her to try to apologize, having no idea, you know, what's happening. He goes and he knocks on the door and she don't answer. He thinks she's mad. So he leaves the breakfast there and he goes back down and tells them all that, no, she wouldn't speak to me, you know, because she's mad. And um, it's let go because the situation, you know, nobody really knows that anything is wrong. And he didn't see any of the blood that was on the floor. After all, he wasn't really paying attention, was he? So, um, now that it's the next morning, Eric is going to go to try to get to the cars, to, or to the car to try to go get help. So, he goes out, you know, there's the goodbyes and be carefuls and he goes out and um, hears a noise over there by the, a little away from the lodge is a storeroom, a storehouse. So he kind of hears a noise over there and he starts walking in that direction. And they've all went back inside because it's freezing. And he, as, as far as they know, he is going to get help. Now, he notices blood trail in the snow and he starts following it so when he gets um, 
to the end of the blood trail, he finds her body, Ingen. And he bends down and he's like, oh my God. And he gets hit in the back of the head. All you see is a pickaxe go to his head and that killer standing be behind him. And um, so it then flashes back inside. So you've got that moment that, well, what is it? Is he dead? What? Who knows? So, Yannicka and Mikhail go back down into the basement where they are trying to, you know, find out, well, the, the petrol is running out, so the lights are flickering. So they go back down there to put more gas in, you know, there, where they find a little room. And when she walks into it, it's like hidden behind a bunch of stuff. She walks into it, and there's just all of this stuff. You know, I mean, there's just all of this stuff. Glasses, eyeglasses, clothes. And she, at first, they think, well, this must be some kind of, like, lost and found for the lodge. And they find an even further room right through it. And it's got a lantern that's on. And they look around and notice that you know, someone's been eating there, um, and they find even more stuff, eyeglasses, boxes of keys, um, boxes of wedding rings and jewelry and things like that, and they start getting spooked because, you know, somebody is here, somebody has been living in this motel, um, and they really start freaking out because a lot of the items you know this place has been abandoned since 1975 it's been closed for 30 years but the stuff that they're finding is recent you know throughout the decades they find stuff that is new and modern so this of course I immediately was like, well, that's trophies, right, from the kills. This this guy has been killing people because, you know, you've seen the sheriff um, looking at newspaper clippings and stuff of all of the disappearances that have happened in the mountain um, since 1975. So... We know that these are a bunch of trophies of all these missing people. It has to be. So, Yannicka goes upstairs to try to talk to Ingrid. I mean, <laughs> Ingrid. Ingen. I told you, I'm going to have problems with these names. But, um, so she gets up there to talk to Ingen. And instead, she opens the door. She's like, come on, this, this, your pissed off thing is, is boring now. So she opens the door and finds a bloodbath. Now we know Ingen's body was out there in the snow because Eric had found it. But she finds the murder scene, you know. So Mikhail comes running and so does Morton. And, you know, they can see that shit has hit the fan. They find her locket, which is actually, it looked a lot like this one. And it's laying in a big pool of blood and there's blood everywhere in that room where she's obviously been in. so these three these three you know are freaked out now they know they have put it all together the, the the person living there ingrid has obviously been ingrid has obviously been murdered i'm just going to call her ing but um she's obviously been murdered the movie has really hyped up the tension and they start we've got to get out of here we've got to go so yeah so Jan tells them and shows them the kill scene and it's game on they run and hide in in a in one of the rooms um, because this thing this dude is in the hallway and comes after him. So they run and hide in the room and Mikhail 
he goes to try to find Ingen after a while. I mean, because he like, um, they don't know what to do. They're just trapped in this room. Uh, waiting uh, for what? For Eric to find help? We know that's not going to happen. So they are just waiting in this room. He, you know, Morton, he is like terribly hurt with a broke leg. So Mikhail, he finally is feeling really guilty about Ingen being obviously butchered. So he's actually going to go out and try to find him. Well, that's, you know, you should never do that in a slasher. I think a lot of times, though, viewers don't realize the people in the movie don't know they're in a slasher, even though they should. You do, but they don't. So quit blaming them for that. But he is guilty, so he's going to go. He thinks that maybe she's still alive. Who knows? So he goes, you know, and, and Morton and him have a fight because Morton tells him, did you see all that blood? Okay. Your girlfriend has been cut to pieces, Okay. And they have a fight about that, but he goes out to try to do that. And then I put a little note here. Scared myself with vape smoke and peripheral vision. Okay, that, it, that was funny. Because when I tell you this movie is intense, I was in the zone. And when you smoke a vape, I'll show you. You have smoke. Okay. So I was sitting here, and I had just taken a hit off the vape, and Mikhail goes out to go try to find her. And he is creeping around, <laughs> you know, and he goes out to, um, he's going to go out to the barn, to that storeroom. And Yannicka and... Morton are watching him out the window and so we're in a very tense moment and I had taken a hit off the vape and the smoke had kind of whiffed around and so I'm just sitting here watching it very very intensely and the smoke in my peripheral vision was like right here and something I scared the absolute shit out of myself because when I saw that whiff of smoke I was just like oh shit mother oh my god and I actually got the tingles you know the tingle when you get a good jump scare I scared the absolute shit out of myself with a with fucking vape smoke it was hilarious so it definitely had put me in the zone and um as soon as Mikhail steps towards the door to open the door of the storeroom, he gets in a bear trap, <laughs> you know, snap on his leg. And um, they, of course, are seeing this, and he manages to get it, you know, to get the thing off. And here comes, and here comes this guy, the killer, but he hides on the roof of that bear trap I mean of that place and um, goes back manages to get back in there with them with Yannicka and Morton so yeah let me make sure of course the killer is a hot on his heels so he tries to break in the door um, He runs out the window, and he gets caught and killed. So, Mikhail is out, and he gets, I put it at 8 out of 10 bareback, a uh, bareback? <laughs> back break. <laughs> a break, an 8 out of 10 break, back break scene. That was difficult. <laughs> but the killer like grabs him and just basically bends him in half. And uh, that was a pretty... I'm leaving that alone. <laughs> I'm leaving that Freudian slip. <laughs> but... <laughs> So, of course, now Yannicka and Morton are scared to death. 
And that's another thing I wanted to mention about this movie is the acting in this movie is phenomenal. Um, it might have something to do with uh, the machismo and the um, toxic masculinity that they talk about and, you know, all of that because this is not an American movie. So the guys are scared like they should be. You know, it's sort of equal. Um, the expressions on Mikhail and Morton's face, um, they are genuinely terrified. They, they genuinely have tears running down their face. They are, they are really scared. They're just as scared as anybody would be in that scene. And I think that's what drags you into the movie even more, is that. So, um, Yannicka and Mort Mort Morton are trying to find their way out. They end up going and um, she hides him in the pantry in the kitchen. And, you know, he's, of course, having a mental breakdown uh, with all of this going on. She manages to get him in there and it's like I'm going to go try to find a way out so she goes out to that place out to the storeroom um, and she finds skis and she finds a sled exactly what she needs um, you know but um, it doesn't work she's freaking out she's about to have a mental breakdown this killer is coming after her she has a a breakdown moment but she does find a shotgun and she remembers when they were rummaging through the house to help him with his broke leg she had found a shotgun shell so she takes the shotgun back into the house gets the shell goes and gets more you know Morton and they start trying to get out through the basement by going they don't know what to do so they're like, well, what if we lure him in here and lock him in here? So that's the plan that they come up with to try to get out of this shit. And it starts to work. It's going to work. You, can, you know, I mean, they do have a plan. And it's going to work except she discovers their bodies, the bodies of Mikhail and Inga and and she finds Eric. However, Eric is alive, which scares the shit out of you. And so in the middle of her breakdown of finding him, he like snaps too. And he's still alive, but he's hurt bad. And he can't move. So there's a kink in the plan now because they've already started the luring and the killer is coming and they do manage to get him locked into that basement and Morton is like let's haul ass and she's like we can't because Eric is in there that's her boyfriend and he's in there alive so what are they going to do now well they're like okay we can lure him back out and you shoot him, right? So they get in position to do that. And remember, they've only got one shotgun shell. And so he indeed comes walking to the door. They had unlocked it, the little thing they had put on it to lock it. They had took it off, went over there and stood by the wall, waiting for him to come out, threw a wrench to get his attention. So he comes and throws open the door and he's holding the living Eric in front of him. Well, she was finger on the trigger to pull it the second that that door opened. And she did, but Morton saw Eric, knocked it out the way. So she shoots the fucking wall with the one shell that they've got. At which point Eric has served his purpose right. And so the killer like puts a pickaxe right through him through the back and so he is murdered horribly right in front of both of them what are they going to do now well Morton he sac sacrifices his life for it basically 
and tells her to run because the killer doesn't know that that was the only shell. So Morton holds it on him while she runs and he fakes him for a minute but that guy he don't care much you know shoot me whatever and you find out as the trilogy goes why he is that way so he comes after Martin Morton and they end up he ends up killing him horribly and that's to be expected. He was my crush, so I, of course, know my crush is always going to die horribly. So, let me catch up. He comes out the door and he's holding Eric in front, so she suits to the side, wasting the one bullet. He kills him in front of them. Um, she runs, Morton makes her run, he holds the gun on him, and that's when she goes out to the storeroom to try to get away, because what can she do except she remembers seeing those skis, so she goes and she puts on those skis and she starts trying to get away, when all of a sudden, what do you think, the killer is right behind her, and screen goes black so you're like well that can't be it because she's the final girl you know so she then snaps too and you see her in this weird position it's like her head is leaned back over something so she basically wakes up and the other bodies are piled on her. Her four friends are dead, piled on top of her. So obviously he thought that he had killed her um, when all he had did was hit her in the back of the head. So she realizes what's going on and he's dragging the sled. So she plays dead. They get to this ravine, in a, the, you know, a big ravine in a glacier and he starts throwing the bodies, so he throws two of them off, then he throws Eric off of her, and then he comes and throws Martin off of her. Now, she had found a knife, one of those slide knives that you can keep in your pocket, like a box cutter, but not that triangle one, but instead it's the long one that comes out of the plastic thing. So she found that in uh, Morton's pocket. So every time the killer would turn around, she would throw her head back and play dead. So when he was dragging the last body, she jumps up and runs over, runs over there to the edge. And here comes this final battle between them two. She cuts him and he knocks her down. They fight over the pickaxe and she ends up putting it through him and makes him fall into uh, the ravine with the bodies and on the way down we see a flashback of his and that is those two parents in that interview we see the flashback of him and we had also just seen his face during that fight, which we had not seen in this movie. Because he wears these goggles and, you know, fur hat and stuff. And that was, we saw the big facial birthmark. So in the flashback, we see him. He's that little boy from the beginning of the movie. And we see his parents kicking uh, snow over him down in a hole so the parents had never he had never ran away they had in their opinion killed him and that's who this killer was so Yannicka she is traumatized and she looks down and she sees the bodies and all laying down there and then that's where you know, the credits roll, and that's the end of the movie. 
Now, of course, I've been trying to condense these more, but yet still tell the basics of the story. There is a great deal more that goes on, character development, clues, little stuff with the sheriff, you know, backstory about the, all the disappearances that this all culminated into showing you. And, yeah, so that was Cold Prey. And it is a fantastic slasher, if you have never seen it. Now, it's pretty easy to find on, like, eBay and stuff for a very reasonable price. And it does come with English dub and or subtitles, whichever pleases you. Now, I am one of those that I would rather a bad dub, as long as it's acceptable, but a bad dub than having to read and try to focus on a movie at the same time. I don't like it. But um, I think what a lot of people need to understand about dubs is that the reason that dubbing can be not that great is you have to remember that when these scenes were being done, the, you know, the, the emotion in your voice, the screaming, the tension, the falling, the discussion, that's, that's real hard to do with some people sitting around a microphone at a table. That's the reason why dubbing on movies is so bad. Some are better than others, but the point is, you know, you've got this real tense scene where somebody's crying and carrying out. Well, the actors are able to do that in their native language. They're able to do that in the scene. But having some actors or some voice actors come in and sit around a table and dub a movie, they can't get the same emotion that you can when you're actually physically doing the scene. So that's the reason why I have a lot of forgiveness for dubbing, you know, because I understand that they can't get the same emotion as that, you know, as that. And I would rather, as long as the dubbing is accurate to what's being said, I can handle stupid dubbing more than having to listen to a language that I don't understand. I might can hear the emotion in the language, but I still don't know what they're saying. Um, so... I'll listen to a bad dub than having to read and watch action at the same time. I, I guess I wouldn't mind, I don't mind dubbing in low, low action movies, low key movies, that's just people sitting around talking and, but having to follow action and see visual clues and being interested in that while also having to read long lines of dialogue it just you know that's my opinion on dubbing I will take a shitty dub over having to read subtitles but you can you, this does come with dubbing and it has subtitles so you can do both of them like I said it is an absolute fantastic slasher if you don't have this trilogy you really should well, the third one's impossible to find, and we'll talk about that. But, um, yeah, Cold Prey, 2006, everything about this movie. And I really love all of the nods to The Shining, because this movie really had a lot of the atmosphere of The Shining without any similarity in story. There was nothing supernatural, there was nothing, you know, anything like that. But just the overall, you can, you can tell they took a lot of knives from it. So, yeah, trying to keep this shorter. So that is Cold Prey. I cannot praise it enough if you have not seen it. It has phenomenal, phenomenal kills. Ingen's kill was just horrific. Um, he was pretty creative. Um, he was definitely a pickaxe killer. Um, lots of nods to The Shining as far as atmosphere goes. The, the 
backstory to the kid, the killer. Um, you get a lot of the beginnings of that in this movie, which is continued in the second and fulfilled in the third, which makes this such a wonderful trilogy. But uh, yeah, so that's Cold Prey 2006. I will be right back to discuss the second one and continue the story. So yeah, Cold Prey 2006, one of the best slasher trilogies ever. The third of one, the third one of which is sits in my top twenty slashers of all time. So I will see you in the next video, and. Always remember and never forget, you are a wonderful and special person. And don't let anyone ever do anything or say anything to make you think anything different. And I will see you in the next video. Love you. Miss you. Bye-bye. And thanks for taking the time to check it out. And tell me what you think about Cold Prey. If you have not seen it, you really should. And ta-ta for now.